Good morning, everyone. It's great to see all of you. Welcome to the Jewish Art Salon Open Studios program. This program is hosted and curated by me, I'm Judith Joseph, and my partner, Dorit Jordan Dotan. And our uh, program advisor is Jewish Art Salon founder and director, Yona Verver. And team members are Hanna Elias and uh, Cheslin Amato. Thank you, Judy, and welcome to everyone. The Open Studios programs feature artists who are members of the Jewish Art Salon who responded to a call or were invited. Please note, the Jewish Art Salon website has a new call for artists for the next Open Studios program, After the Flood, Regenesis. We welcome you to submit your art. Mark your calendars. The next Jewish Art Salon Open Studios program will be in two weeks. Tuesday, March 9 at noon Eastern time. Artist presenters will be Jewish Art Salon founder and director Yona Verwer and Cynthia Beit Rubin. On Sunday, March 14 at 2 p.m. Eastern time, we will have a special edition of the Open Studios program featuring Jewish Art Salon members who are included in a joint exhibit, Intensity Identity at Adas Israel Congregation in Washington, D.C. Jewish Art Salon artists, Bill Hazusman, Diane Kurtz, Rachel Cantor, Hillel Smith, and Heather Stones will be featured a long commentary by curator Ori Solex and exhibition organizer, Robert Bateman. Our feature artists today are Tina Marcus, Karen Kassap, and Stephen Rudin. Today, we will dive into spaces of wonder and explore collages as metaphor for memory and identity, a personal artistic response to pandemic that relies on medieval manuscript iconography, a perspective on how the ordinary, mundane, and extraordinarily present itself. Uh, Judith, okay. it's all yours. Thank you. Memory and self-reflection are important elements to be found in the work of today's artists. Karen Kassab asks, what good is an omen if you can only see its meaning by looking back? Her collage work contains elements of historical imagery as she contemplates the current plague state of the world. As a healer and, and medical practitioner, Stephen Rudin considers history in the context of case history. He creates intricate imagined worlds with collage, perhaps seeking to fulfill the dictum, physician, heal thyself. For Tina Marcus, the techniques of collage and assemblage are the tools of self-assembly. Perhaps she has her own golem created from bits of paper, ink, and paint. Tina Marcus is our first artist today. She describes her work as soul selfies. Whereas people today are taking pictures of themselves with their phones, she is painting snapshots of personal defining moments. Tina's multimedia assemblages are her selfies. Her works focus on the human figure documenting historical and spiritual experiences while exploring conditions and circumstances with themes revolving around aging, solitude, isolation, and ambiguity. Working mostly with powdered pigments, spray paint, modeling medium, and flooding her canvases with water and varnish. Tina's approach is grounded in the unexpected, spontaneity, chance, and experimentation. The joy and excitement of producing art for Tina comes from the unpredictable. Currently, she chairs the Chagall Society, housed within the Jewish Federation of Raleigh Carey. Her paintings have been exhibited at Duke University and in galleries in North Carolina. Her works are in both private and corporate collections, and she looks forward to her two upcoming exhibitions. Go ahead, Tina. Well, thank you so much, Jewish Art Salon, for inviting me to share my work with all of you. It's really, truly an honor and a privilege to have my work invited and be highlighted with the esteemed artists, Karen Kassip and Steve Rudin, as well as in past presentations. I also wanna say thank you to Dorit, Judith, Yona, Cheslin, and Hannah, and the others who are behind the scenes who have helped put forward this wonderful programming. 
And so, yes, I do call my work soul selfies, where people today are taking pictures of themselves with their phones. I'm painting snapshots of defining moments in my life. <clears throat> Excuse me. My assemblages are my selfies documenting historical, spiritual, ordinary, and mundane circumstances. So before I jump into my work, I'd like to share one of my favorite quotes um, with the artist Francis Bacon about spontaneity. He says on, sponta on spontaneity, accepting accidents as integral aspects of the, com of the composition, we achieve true emotional candor. I don't in fact know very often what the paint will do, and it does many things which are very much better than I can make it do. And I love this statement because I feel that it captures me and my creative personality and spirit. So when I was thinking about preparing this presentation, it posed several challenges for me. Do I express my work chronologically, in reverse, or in some other way? As it's really been the last two and a half to three years that I've been producing work full time. Prior to that, I was a weekend warrior. So my work has changed, it's expanded, it's been fluid and more intuitive in its application and processes and my views on life. But yet at the same time, maintaining the core materials that I really enjoy working with, which are powdered pigments, modeling medium, <clears throat> vellum, and spray paints. So I opened my studio with the four following pieces, a wrinkle in time, <clears throat> P19 collateral damage, grounded, and in that moment, which were conceptualized back in March of last year, reacting to an incident I had seen on the news where deceased bodies in New York were being buried in a mass grave. This profound incident and image compelled me to, compelled me to create memorial pieces, remembering the lives and honoring those of those unclaimed victims resulting from this viral pandemic war. A Wrinkle in Time is a memorial for those global victims who died with each cluster representing continents and dots mapping representing perished souls. C-19 collateral damage, along with A Wrinkle in Time, were created out of tracing paper, charcoal, and canvas, and carefully chosen for these pieces. Although delicate and unassuming in appearance, the message reminds us how vulnerable and how fragile life is. This work portrays tracking, tracing, containment, and the spread through the lens of an aerial landscape. Ground had responded to the news being reported of an agricultural supply chain breakdown where tons of milk was being dumped into fields along with fruits and vegetables, along with the slaughtering of livestock. I found this most disturbing as many in our country are on food lines and need of these precious resources. Grounded depicts how we are drowning in wasteful resources, debt, and human suffering. During this pandemic, hum humanity has been grounded one way or another. In that moment, in that moment addresses isolation, whether being in a lockdown state, which of course can have many interpretations, be it physically, mentally, or both. Whatever the circumstances for that moment, or my other assemblages, they are ambiguous in nature, and I leave it to the viewer to find additional meanings. So I've heard a lot of people talk in this series and other fellow creatives talk about feeling somewhat guilty about having more focused and being more productive with the self-isolation that uh, C-19 COVID has thrust us into. And I too fell into that category. I found myself with uninterrupted time of solitude with no distraction to take deeper dives into the things that mattered most in honing my craft. In a way, I selfishly welcomed this. I focused more on the human figure, exploring conditions and circumstances with themes revolving around aging, solitude, isolation, and ambiguity, whereas my earlier works were very abstract, as seen in the next two slides. Lineage was a work that was done years ago when I called my work Primitive Graffiti, which is still my handle for um, Instagram, and Memento Mori and Scorch Scrolls. So now let's fast forward to this past year, 2020, with outcomes of introspection. I produced man, gray matter, is and was, crouched figures, and many others. In this slide, man is at center stage and surrounded and caught up with an overlay of stuff. It's really the uh, expression on his face, or should I say faces, that defines man. 
My works intentionally have minimal recognizable backgrounds or forms, if any, zeroing in on the human form as with crouched figure. I focused on the figure with body language, the physicality of shape, and the aging process. Classical figure was looking at the physicality of shape and stance and abandoned, looking at the aging process, exploring the degradation of the human condition. I also thought a lot about isolation and walls this past year. I thought that walls were being physical structures that enclose, divide, create space, that form obstacles, but at the same time protect and lend privacy. I also thought about walls being emotions or behaviors, expressing, expressing physicians inviting curiosity, or that might be defeat, failure, or preventing any type of interaction. But walls in the broadest terms that I thought were bringing people together, such as this COVID wall that has brought us here together today around the nation and internationally in a virtual meetup. This is a background of a current uh, uh, work that I'm on, and I know that I'll have many uh, figures placed on top of it. Another phenomenon began to occur with my works um, as depicted in this slide of my studio, where while I work on five to seven paintings at a time, I started making multiple pours of the same figures, which when placed to dry in my studio began to face off with one another and seemingly have relationships and conversations with each other which conceptually led me to, should I stop here or keep going? Which really begs the question, who is asking the question? So the next several slides of my assemblage is portray those moments. I believe we all have in our lives, uh, but for us uh, may embody different types of points of view and may take on different meanings as time passes. Here is is and was the outcome of thinking of what is today and what was, the figure on the left being fuller in stature and more robust, however the thighs revealing the vellum in which the figure was poured, and then there's a figure on the right with, who is less robust and seemingly on frail legs. You are familiar, do I know you? Have you ever had that feeling? I know that I have, and again, this painting can take on many different interpretations. Is this individual questioning who they are or personally questioning who are they or questioning who are they? And here's a detail. So you have a little bit of the idea of the textual quality of the vellum on the background. And so in this work, as well as others, I maintain some presence of the vellum in which the figures are poured. How the vellum is manipulated and where it's retained contributes to the narrative and for further interpretation. And I'll just back step a second to get the full view again. And there's wandering and wondering. I'm sure we've all had those moments. Thinking man. And here's a detail of Thinking Man, so you have a better idea of the textual quality of the figure that was poured on the background. An opal daydream. I think you'll start to recognize the figure as the same as should I stop here? But it's a, it's a good example of creating multiple pores with each figure similar. <laughs> with each figure similar, but with uh, a unique fingerprint. And here's a detail. So now that we're here just about a shy of a year later and perhaps turning the corner on a healthier environment, Standing Man, She Is, and Guardian are my most recent assemblages and, and executed within the last eight weeks. Their presence exists in that nanosecond of space and time of exiting or entering, or entering or exiting. Who are they? Where are they going? What are their circumstances? Here is standing man facing forward and steadfast. In all of these pieces, there's no one single interpretation and the message is not static. I leave it to the viewer to find additional meaning in, for themselves. The image in the title opens the door 
For me to be explicit would be like telling the viewer how a movie or a book ends. And I also anticipate in time that my work will take on new meanings as time passes. And yet another detail, so you can see a little bit of the textural quality of the vellum and then the background. So before I close out, I wanna share a bit about the processes of these assemblages. Behind each port figure, there are drawings. First, I start out with the basic premise that the form will either be male or female. Then I draw multiples of the same image and I use them as templates. Some of the drawings are just mere sketches while other figures are fully developed as in each. This assemblage is a work in progress. And of course, I might find myself pouring even more multiples of the same image. The forms are poured and manipulated onto the vellum. And then the drawing is lost forever, which is the, one of the reasons why I like to make drawing templates in case I'd like to reestablish that particular fi uh, figure or should a, 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 excuse me, a collector want to buy the original. What I really enjoy about working with modeling medium is while I have an idea and an image in mind for that form, it's really when the figures are drawing, do they start to take on and reveal their personality as with crouched figure, which goes back to my original appreciation of Bacon's quote, I don't know in fact, know very often what the paint, and in my case, the modeling medium will do, and it does many things which are very much better than I can make it do. So on the left, it was recently poured, and then the figure on the right, this is a few days later after some manipulation and drawing. So lastly, I enjoy, I enjoy collecting found objects, or should I say they enjoy finding me with Collection Box. Collection Box was made from an incredibly old bed frame, twine and stones from Dachau concentration camp. The box portrays a place where countless individuals and concentration camps turned to express Sadaka. Made from bed frames and twine are materials that would have been found in and around the barracks and easily hidden and disguised from the Nazis. Although stripped of all material belongings and torn from family, contained in this box are memories and dreams. Stones are placed in the box to represent those who are thankful to still be alive and to remember those who have perished. These stones are from Dachau when I visited the camp. And now on a little lighter note, <clears throat> torso, <clears throat> excuse me, torso is it from wood, <clears throat> excuse me, and found in my backyard after utility work was done and they didn't clean up. Normally I would be a little annoyed at this, but in this particular case, I'm very thankful they left it. And lastly, shofar, also wood. I found this on one of my walks as I passed by, it looked and sort of shouted out to me, that this might have been a primal artifact and the original show for. So I end my presentation with wandering and wondering and a close up so that you have yet another idea of the textual quality of the figures on the backgrounds in which they are placed. Thank you again for the opportunity to share my work and what I've done with creativity in uncertain times. Tina, thank you so much. This was extraordinary. Wonderful, and a lot of comments you get on the chat that you can read later and we're gonna send it to you. Uh, whoever had um, uh, questions by uh, Renes, you can unmute yourself. And if you uh, stop sharing your screen, you can see everybody. And uh, Rene wanted to ask you something. Rina. It's okay, it's okay. Uh, um, Tina, I, I love your work. It's, it's stunning and very powerful. Um, I'd like if you could talk more about the modeling medium, what you mean by pouring it on it, what, what, can you talk about what you exactly do? Is that okay? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, okay. Yeah, so modeling medium, I mean, they come in different kinds of consistencies and it's sort of like a paste. And so, you know, I work with it. Sometimes it could be straight right from the gallon can, which is really thick and pasty, excuse me. <clears throat> or I might um, water it down or add some additives to it to create something that has a little bit more fluid vis viscosity. And so I, I actually, you know, have the figure drawn. So I have that template and then I pour onto that template, so to speak. And sometimes I'm you know, always using my hands. I don't use brushes. 
And so I create that figure and then I might rock it. I might, you know, shimmy it a little bit, but I like to let it dry because in the drying process, as you know, with paints, if you, you know, don't use it properly or crackle. And I enjoy yeah. that. I, I enjoy working with those mistakes. Yeah, I could see that. I, I that We used to call them happy accidents. Absolutely. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's just beautiful. And did you use it in the background, in the ground as well of the Caribbean? Yes. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, I use pot, uh, powdered pigments. I don't use, you know, um, acrylics or oils out of tubes. So I'm actually really creating my own paint with the modeling medium and, and mixing the, the powdered pigment and it's how I apply it, whether it's mixed in together or, or uh, powdered onto the canvases itself. So it's somewhere between three-dimensional sculpting. It's beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I have a question, Tina, about the piece that is kind of different than the others. It's the one piece of Dachau. Um, do you have any connection uh, to this concentration camp? Did you find it outside? I didn't understand, I wasn't catching that. And can you tell more about this piece? Um, so I don't have any connection to Dachau at all. Um, my husband and I planned a trip to go to Germany years ago. Um, and when I was planning the trip, I, I, you know, I don't know, I guess we felt compelled that we needed to, to make that first stop Dachau. So right from Munich, we, we drove to, to Dachau. We had an extraordinary experience. They have a beautiful museum there. Um, and I actually had collected these rocks. Wherever I go, I collect rocks. And several years later, my husband felt the rocks and he said, oh gosh, he says, I don't know where these rocks are from, but they feel awful. <laughs> And so um, it was just one of those things that just came to me. I had seen the bed frame. I started, you know, creating this thing. And I just thought about, you know, what life might have been for somebody in a concentration camp. What do they have that they can still have the dignity um, and, and yet um, express their feelings for, for those who might have per perished? Thank you. Okay, if anybody else have a question, that's the time to ask. If not, we can do it uh, at the end. We can still have some time for questions. Okay, we're gonna go on with uh, yeah. Karen Castro. Anybody? Okay. Right, you can ask her at the end. Um, I just wanted to comment, Tina, I, I loved your presentation. I found it really powerful and inspiring. And in a, in a certain way, your work reminded me a little bit of Leon Golub who was an artist who was trained at the Art Institute of Chicago. And um, he has a similar textural look and also works with figures, but he only used oil paint. And when you got close to his canvases, you saw that it was completely flat, whereas yours actually do have that tactile quality. So that might be somebody you wanna look at, but of course your work is entirely different and has a completely different feeling to it. But I just wanted to mention him because he's one of my favorites too. I appreciate that and I definitely will check that out. Thank you. Yeah, he's awesome. Okay, well, thank you again. And um, we're going to move on to our next artist. Karen Kessler is a mixed media collage artist based in Woodbridge, Connecticut. Her works explore ideas of female empowerment and the dichotomy between the freedom and confinement of idealized women. Her work grows out of her experience as a woman, mother, wife, and a Jew. Her work is made mostly from papers she has created with paint, pen, pencils, and other mark-making techniques. The many layers of her work are sometimes barely visible to the viewer, but knowledge of their existence is a mystery that draws one in. Patient observation may be rewarded, with a glimpse of what lies between the surface, just as intimacy makes visible the hidden layers of oneself. Most recently, she has begun series, which is personal response to the pandemic and relies on medieval manuscript, iconography, and Ptolemaic imagery. Please go ahead, share your screen, Karen. So thank you. I hope it's working the way I'm intending it to. Um, Thank you to Jewish Art Salon for giving me the opportunity to show my work today. And thank you, especially to Cynthia Beth Rubin who introduced me to Jewish Art Salon. And thank you to all who are virtually here with me. 
Um, kudos to Tina. I feel really uh, proud to be showing my work with her and I'm looking forward to seeing Steve Rudin's work as well. Um, so first, what I'm going to do is briefly, briefly show you a few of my early works. I will show you something about my process and then I will share my quarantine series. Um, as we already heard, my work is very personal form of expression and I am interested in the conflicts between the idealized woman and the lives that actual women live. Um, most of my work has been made while I was raising my children and my role as a traditional Jewish homemaker was often in my mind. So as an example of my earlier work, um, this piece I call Kaparot is a reference to a ritual in which we hold the bird above our heads and ask it to take away our sins before we begin the new year. If the woman doesn't let go, the bird could also represent her means of escape from the domestic chores that surround her. Um, this piece I call the Red Queen refers to many ideas of female empowerment. And as my children became more independent, my role as mother, wife, and homemaker changed. And the focus of my work began to reflect that. This piece, The Sea and the Shore, was completed shortly after my children graduated college and moved into their own homes. It contains memories of their childhood playing at the seaside and the future course that our family ship would take. Um, you can see like in the bottom right corner and sort of to the middle on the left, I used a technique of um, transferring images um, to the collage. So just as I was starting to settle into this new phase of my art in my life, COVID arrived and I knew COVID would play a role in my work, but I had never approached my work in a way so influenced by the outside world. Ideas from my work always felt as though they emerged from deep inside me. And now I felt squeezed in by the external world. When I feel creatively stuck, I either clean the studio or start making papers. And the process of making paper is experimental and very liberating. And that's what these past three slides were papers that I make, I usually just rip them up and cut them up, but the making of them can be part of the creative process. So with no idea of the end result, I began a collage, which I now call Medieval Monsters. The idea of a medieval world that believed in monsters and demons that was mystified by science and biology, and that was afraid of the unknown would direct my COVID series. It makes sense since it is the time of the bubonic plague, and here also I'm exploring the idea of the Ouroboros, the eternal cycle, renewal, life, death, and rebirth. What good is an omen if you can only understand its meaning by looking back became the way in to my COVID series. Questions of omens have always haunted me and now the world seems strangely full of hidden meaning. I began with postcard sized studies of journal like entries. I'm going to show you the studies and then I'll show you the, the completed works. So this is uh, March, beginning with um, Ki Tisa, which was the Parsha um, that occurred right after Purim. By April, I tried to make my home into a cocoon of safety. I cleaned my house of chametz and made seders as if the observance of Passover could fight back the plague. Many deaths touched my life. So these are representing those weeks and months. In May, I asked myself, why is it snowing on Mother's Day while the tulips were blooming? And I wondered if a black wedding in June could save us. Shavuot follows Pesach and then there was an explosion of gun violence, the killing of black people, a cry for justice, Sedek was heard. What follows are the works that grew out of these studies. I'm showing them to you chronologically, but not necessarily in the order in which I made them. An homage to Purim, since it seemed ironic that the holiday of mass should mark the beginning of COVID um, is where I'm starting. There are many details in the Purim story that connected to my feelings at that time. The Megillah, a long story with a violent ending, Esther's role in pointing out the evil Haman, and the reign of chaos. 
Uh, the next slide is a detail. Um, the masking of the heroine's name Hadassah with Esther, the lots of chance, and a very foolish king. This work I call Kitisa because it is the parsha which followed Purim. It marked the last Shabbat I attended shul in person, and twin sisters were being bat mitzvahed. Working on this piece was joyous and uplifting after a lot of months of feeling really down. I have the girls holding open the Torah scroll and I've presented the text as an illuminated manuscript. I'm gonna show you some uh, details. Although the lung shaped flowers and the dots in the border are foreboding, I loved thinking about the young girls bursting with confidence, intelligence and beauty. With a nod to the late medieval pre-Renaissance technique of including the patron looking in on the scene, I included an adult onlooker, maybe the artist. By using the language of Psalm 27, when evildoers draw near to eat my flesh, I acknowledge the danger of the external world while creating a cocoon of safety in faith and family. These monsters are based on creatures included in many illuminated manuscripts I studied. The use of medieval imagery continued to become the unifying theme for my series. Although as I prepared for this talk, I began to see the unconscious focus I had placed on hands. Hands protecting, hands accusing, hands blessing, and hands inflicting harm. In this second cocoon collage, I hope to focus more on the pleasure of cocooning with less emphasis on the outside threats. I meant to express the desire to protect, shelter, and nurture. And as in the previous cocoon, the hands are significant. Until the, uh, the pandemic, I was unaware of this idea of a black wedding. But as soon as I read about this Eastern European superstition of marrying an unmarriageable couple in a cemetery as a way of warding off the plague, I knew I had to create this collage. I intentionally presented it with a duality of ideas. Does the chupa provide protection or not? Is the hand delivering plague or shelter? Is their marriage unique in its significance? Is it a sacrifice or a blessing? So um, I hope the lighting is, is good that you can see the monster is hidden on the right-hand side in the dark, holding up the chupa, and the left side is the light and the life-affirming flowers. I also use the symbolism of medieval and early Renaissance art by giving the couple bare feet, which represents that they are standing on hallowed ground, mourning or entering a sanctuary. The bride carries the lily symbolizing purity and the hands are held in union, in hope and in fear. Expressing my feelings about gun violence, police violence, Black Lives Matter, the last election and democracy was difficult for me. And I relied on the monsters uh, to help me express the idea that we all struggle with demons. This felt authentic to me. I decided to present the ideas in a triptych. So this is the left panel um, and I call it, do not kill. Um, I feel that death has been the overwhelming experience of COVID. And there are a few images more full of despair than the heads of Eve and Adam in Masaccio's expulsion from Eden. So thank you, Masaccio, because that was where I began. I'm gonna show you some details now. So these are the hands that hold the guns. And these are the monsters inside of us. The next slide is the second um, piece of the triptych. I call this justice. Here I admit to a more modern influence. Um, 
Domier's clenched fist. I could not get it out of my mind, so it came out here. The hand metaphors come in the fist of anger and the clenched fist holding the scales of justice. This is the top of the headstone where spiritual or religious images are traditionally placed. And here I put the dove representing peace and the light of God. At the bottom, the medieval monsters are still menacingly below the surface, never really gone. Um, so the third panel, I present to you with the caveat that it's a work in progress. Um, I'm calling it knowledge uh, for now. Heralded by the tools of science and learning, I wanted to balance the intense emotions of the other two panels with hope and logic. Instead of monsters, there is the female headed snake, the emblem of the search for knowledge of good and evil, science and art. And Eve, the Eve figure holds a book and the future, a child in her arms. And this is my last slide. Um, and this is the three pieces of the triptych together. So I just wanna thank you so much for letting me share my work with you. Give us another minute, if you would, just to look at this. Oh, of course. Before you stop here, <laughs> I need a little more time with it. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I might have gone a little faster than I planned. No, 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 you're perfect. <laughs> Um, there's just so much imagery and symbolism packed into this. I didn't want to miss out. And it's also important, I think, to see the triptych together, to see how the composition flows and how one part links with the other part, which is so beautifully done. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was Thank beautiful. you. Yes. Um, and I'm looking at the chat um, and you have lots of accolades and praise. Um, I don't know about questions. Um, so if somebody has a question, you can, un you can, um, stop your share now. Yeah. So we can see each other. Great. Um, if somebody has a question, I guess, uh, you can just unmute and jump in. What are the things that uh, do not kill? The one that was you, uh, yes. one. can you tell a bit more about it? Um, Actually, my favorite. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I really did start with trying to think about the pain of loss, the agony, and, um, you know, for as long as I've ever looked at art, the Masaccio expulsion, I just feel such a deep loss. Um, and I felt it expressed the loss that all of us feel. Um, and I also just had that image of the guns in my head. And I really wanted something that was specific, but general. And I felt like the sixth commandment relates to all of us. You don't have to be a particular kind of person or know a person. It's just, it's essential to civilized culture. So that kind of came to me that way. And I guess I felt that the, the demons, which I use throughout my work, um, help us to think about where that comes from, that evil from ourselves or from outside. Thank well, you. Oh, you want to, or do you want me to talk about technical? <laughs> I suddenly no. got really emotional, I'm sorry. Maybe I should have just told you about like <laughs> the paint and paper. I think emotions are closer to the surface okay, these days, yeah. I'm finding. Um, Audrey had a question about scale. Go ahead, Audrey Anastasi. Uh, uh, hi there. Yeah, that's that's a, my main question. I was curious about the scale of the works. Um, I, I really like the density and, and the um, connection of all the symbolism. Uh, I, I really think you did a great job with that. But I was curious whether I was looking at you know, uh, pieces that were six feet tall or 24 inches tall, so. Right, I put the measurements on all the slides. So um, like, but the, if you're talking about the triptych in particular, 
Um, I think it's like yeah. 24 by 30. No, that one's not. That's sorry, wrong one. Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking through my notes here. Um, Each one is 24 by 14, at least that's what your slide said. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so glad you found my slide for me. Yes, they're 24 <laughs> by 14, the three, the triptych pieces. The others are different sizes. I, I did put the dimensions. And if I can read faster, I can find the other ones for you. Judith, can I make a comment? Yeah, I was just going to invite you to, Richard. Go oh, ahead. Thank you. Karen, wow. Uh, Koch, just really uh, amazing work. And uh, quite frankly, um, since my work deals exclusively with the Torah, I consider your work courageous because you are digging in deep to Torah and making it uh, making it contemporary. So two questions. One, um, uh, your process, uh, which I'll never never ask about people's process, but your process in terms of learning. Uh, do you have someone that you learn with? Do you simply open up a say for yourself and, and dig for things and wait for them to come? That's one thing. And secondly, I have never heard of a black wedding. Could you fill me in? Okay, so um, a black wedding, I'd be happy later, I can give you like citations, but the New York Times early on in the pandemic and then the Tablet Magazine, I don't know if you read that, they both had articles about this Eastern European superstition. And the idea was that the community would find unmarriageable and there are you know, different takes on it, uh, but people who couldn't, that were either impoverished or had some kind of health or mental problems and they would bring them in the, they were like a sacrifice marriage, but also in another way of looking at it, it was people who maybe couldn't afford a wedding or couldn't, weren't weren't accepted as a couple otherwise and their marriage was meant to be though like a sacrifice you know same way as I started like with the copper oath it was a way of um, mm -hmm. making an offering and by supporting their marriage or sacrificing their marriage mm -hmm. it was supposed to bring the end to a plague it was um, in I think 1918 the the Spanish flu it, there were articles like from the in uh, New York Times or in the Philadelphia area also and there are uh, evidence of it in Eastern Europe earlier. It's not like super common, but it definitely happened. Wow. wow. Um, and as far as my learning, I'm a lifelong learner, I'm very active in my, my synagogue. And I um, learn from people I'm with and I learn on my own. And um, mm -hmm. I try to think about the meaning of what I'm learning to my life. It shows beautifully, congratulations. I just, I just wanted to, to jump in and say that they have had uh, black weddings in the United States also. Yes, that, in 1918, yeah. there are several yeah. that were reported. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to, I, yeah, I can send you a link. Reva Lehrer in her book called Golem Girl wrote about the phenomenon of the black wedding from the point of view of a disabled person because really there's a real cruelty to it because it's an inversion of the usual celebration. It's turning everything on its head in order to change the, the way things are and the way things were, were a plague. So um, she, she gives us a little bit of a different perspective on that. Um, Cynthia, let's see, I just saw a question from Carol Anshine. Would you like to uh, unmute yourself please and ask your question? Yeah, my question was in the triptych which is so powerful. The left side of it seems so much more intense and the figures larger. And, and I'm wondering if you did that one first and if the other two are in, in response um, and the less intense, less larger sense of them, at least as I can see them. I'm just wondering about you, your feelings about doing each of, each of those um, in terms of the difference in intensity and sizes. Right, so thank you for your question. Yes, I did the one on the left first. It was really hard for me to start. I mean, there is so much feeling and I guess I, it's partly why it's so zoomed in and the scale. Um, I wanted the second one to be something about justice and more of a group and larger step away. Uh, so that was the second one. And that's why I'm probably struggling with the third because I'm not entirely happy with it as a conclusion, but I just feel like the other two are so intense and I wasn't ready to do another intense one. You may see in the future, I'll have a different third, a different third one, but I, 
sometimes just need a little relief. It's the same way I felt when I worked on the, the bat mitzvah girls. Uh, I had been working on some other really intense pieces that I just felt like I needed something that even looked a little bit happy. <laughs> well, they're, they're, they're wonderful anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think uh, they are spectacular, and I, I loved your whole presentation. I have so much to talk to you about, but I'll do that later. Um, I'd like to helpful. introduce. Thank you. And Thank you can I just say, much. I really love the cocooning, what you did with the cocooning. It just feels so, so like what I've been feeling like cooped up in my apartment for almost 12 months. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, it's a common well, experience. Stephen Rudin is a visual artist, teacher, and psychiatrist based in New York City. Rudin reimagines hand-cut paper collage as a metaphor for memory and identity. His multi-layered compositions draw viewers into a dialogue about the dynamic nature of the mind. Based on his expertise in cognitive behavioral therapy, his art philosophy examines how stories can be put together in different ways using the same parts. His exhibitions, talks, and classes encourage participants to visualize their inner lives as collage. In mid-2017, Rudin made the shift to art full-time after nearly two decades in clinical, academic, and leadership positions at Columbia University. He holds degrees from Columbia University, Cornell University, and the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. As adjunct faculty at the Art Students League of New York, Rudin leads workshops delving into collage as memoir. His work has been exhibited internationally in galleries, public spaces, and art fairs. Stephen, please unmute yourself and share your screen. Thank you so much for um, including me in this really special series of bringing us together. It's such an honor to speak with you. I'm going to show my screen, but just I want to just open up a little bit and say that, like you said, I'm a visual artist, teacher, and psychiatrist, and I'm interested in art and emotional resilience. And my artwork serves as research for a greater philosophy about what I call the psychology of collage, which is basically the idea that collage is a metaphor for memory and identity. And today I'm going to talk about where I started, where I went, and where I'm going, sort of my COVID story. And I'm going to talk about how I went from figurative collage to geometric abstraction to what I call accidentalism. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about a workshop that I just developed and I just completed a five week online workshop at the Art Students League of New York called Collage as Memoir, Putting the Pieces Together. Now, I think it's important for me to talk a little bit about who I was before the pandemic. I think for a lot of us, it's hard to connect with that person that we were before and a lot of it to imagine a future. But sort of my idea is this, is that again, like that collage is a metaphor for memory and identity, that memories are constructions that each time we bring up a memory, it sort of changes in, in, in a slightly different way, that memories are made up of fragments that are arranged in layers, and that each time we remember it, it sort of configures in a different way, and that the memory can have a drastically different meaning based on what we're feeling in other circumstances. And that I think that this sort of leads to that idea that multiple stories can be told using the same parts. And I think that's a really powerful idea because I think that that's sort of the, the foundation for psychotherapy. So a patient comes in, they sort of come in with a box of their collage parts, they put it together and they say, you know, this is my life story. And then what the therapist says is the therapist says, I understand why you tell it that way. And I can understand why you feel that way, but is there any other way in which we can tell this same story? In other words, can we transform this story maybe from a story of despair and helplessness to a story of maybe hope and strength? So I'm very interested in this idea of telling stories in multiple ways using different parts. And that's sort of what I'm experimenting with. And that's what I'm also doing in a lot of my workshops. So I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna sort of, sort of show my, uh, my COVID um, story. Okay. So this piece is called Bar Mitzvah Noir. And it's a sort of a mashup of my own Bar Mitzvah experience plus stories that my stepfather told me about his bar mitzvah and about him growing up in New York City and taking the train to Coney Island and spending the entire day in the cinema. That was sort of the babysitter at the time. So nothing has changed in terms of babies, movies being babysitters for, for people. So I, what I like to capture is I like to capture in a collage sort of beyond what you might capture in a photograph. So multiple things going on in the same time and more than what you might see if you were actually in, you know, taking a photograph. So I 
put all these different layers together to show that there are things that are going on in our life that are out of our awareness that maybe come into our awareness later and then show up as memory. Now this particular piece is hand cut paper collage. It's about 75 different pieces. It is, um, I, it takes me about three months, maybe sometimes over a year to complete a piece. It's sort of like a chronicle in some ways. It collects sort of my life's experience over time. So it matures with me. Um, the other thing is that uh, I wanna just bring up a stylistic um, important uh, structural component, which is that I use perspective quite a bit. And when people look at my work, they think perspective. And the reason why I use that is for symbolic reasons that perspective is really important in terms of the way we look at life. I have to remind myself that. And of course, that was something that I used a lot as a psychotherapist was the idea that the vantage point that you're looking at, the, at your life determines what you see. So a lot of times we're too close in or we're too far apart. So we need to change our perspective. A lot of times when we change our perspective, the whole scenario looks different. This piece um, is about the idea of, I like to explore sort of these universal themes. And one of the themes that, you know, when I was a psychotherapist, I would think, what's the theme of the day? What's the theme of the day? What's the theme of the week? What's the theme of the month? One of the themes is about moving forward and not knowing exactly where you're going. In other words, putting one foot in front of the other. I think that a lot of times people, myself included, struggle with motivation to move forward without knowing exactly where we're going. So this piece is sort of about the idea of just continuing to move forward, putting one foot in front of the other, and sort of having faith that along the way we'll be able to figure it out. The other idea is that sort of this idea about multiple stories being told in different ways using the same parts is that sometimes just a subtle tweak in the positioning of something changes the story dramatically. So I think about this idea between the border between dystopian and utopian could be just the, the small minor positioning. And in this case, for example, I finished this collage and then I ran it by a friend and my friend said, oh, it looks very dystopian. I thought, oh no, very, very dystopian, but that's not what it's about. I added this red layer, which sort of I, I see as representing because it's closer, it's like a layer that's most recent most recent. And by adding that red layer, that sort of spicy hot layer, it changed the whole frame of things. So I sort of think about it in some ways, it's a little bit tongue in cheek that sometimes people think I need to change everything about my life. I need to change where I live. I need to change where I work. But sometimes we need to just do really subtle, small tweaks and things, and you know, and the, the scene looks very different. I'm the sort of the archivist and the historian in my family. I sort of have always been involved in family photo albums and sort of piecing together my family history. Not like a lot of, not unlike a lot of other Jewish people, I don't know very much about my family, let's say before, you know, 1900. I know that my mother comes from a very large Sephardic family in Chicago. My father comes from a very small Ashkenazic family from New York. So I sort of think of my identity already as a collage. In other words, that the different parts of myself are layered and that all those different, and I also think that some of the characteristics, I, people ask me often, why do you put the old and the new together? And I think of it this way, that there are qualities and characteristics of myself that are generations old, that come from, from you know, that I recognize as me or of the now, but really are qualities and characteristics that have been passed down for centuries throughout my family. This one is called future memory. And it's the idea that we have to look to the past in order to envision the future. And the idea here is this, is that in neuroscience, we think, what is the focus? What is the function of memory? We know that the function of memory is not that it's a historical record, like a court record, this happened, this happened, this happened. We think that it's related to learning, but we also know that it's related to planning. In other words, that many of the greatest innovations have to do with people thinking about what they saw, remembering it, reconfiguring it in some ways and coming up with something new. So that's what this idea is about too, is the idea that everything that we experience in the past and everything we experience in the future will eventually become a memory and it will all become layered on top of each other. And then this became sort of the piece that became emblematic of the, of the, of the, of the COVID era. And I think of art as a place and a friend and art has never let me down. In other words, art has always been there for me and art has always you know, been friendly to me and helped me learn things that I wouldn't have normally learned. And what this piece was about originally was about highlighting or sort of turning the idea on its head that being alone is bad. Again, when I talked about the idea of theme of the day that a lot of what we talk about in you know, psychotherapy is about this idea of being alone. And people think that alone is shameful or that it's scary. But I sort of like the idea of turning it on its head. That's why I call this time of reflection, that being alone is a time where you can reflect and make friends with yourself. And my idea is this also, that we can be our best friend 
but we can also be our worst companion. And so our time alone is sort of a, a way in which we can learn to become friends with ourselves because no matter where you go, you'll always be with yourself. So it's really important that you make friends with yourself and that you don't have to distract yourself all the time with being with other people. And so it, the, also there's a little bit of symbolism here in the sense of a lot of my work has to do with ascension and sort of, I believe in this idea of self-actualization. Maybe I've seen too many Maslow's hierarchies and Eric Erickson's developmental, but I think of these ideas about like going through these developmental phases and getting to the next phase. So a lot of my work has to do with getting to these next phases. Then came COVID. I think of March 13th as sort of the day of reckoning for me. That's when we went into lockdown in New York City. And that was sort of a time of very, very, very dark period. And that period was really painful for me, honestly. I, I felt very disconnected, like I said, from the past. I felt I couldn't even imagine 10 minutes in the future. I felt like I was sort of floating and suspended. I felt intense, intense grief, really, really sad, sadness. And I was really hard on myself. I noticed that I was being extremely critical of myself for everything that I did. I was just like, you know, I was constantly judging myself. And I was observing it. I was thinking to myself, oh, so that's what my grief reaction is. My grief reaction is to sort of blame myself. But I also started to question, like everybody else, you know, in times of stress, to question all these things that I may not have questioned before. And this is sort of a characterization of the idea of like, what's to come? The city was empty and desolate in ways that I had never seen it before. You know, it was sort of fearful just to go to the grocery store. People were wearing gas masks and it was a really difficult time. Now, the other part is that I'm no stranger to grief and post-traumatic stress disorder. In fact, that was one of my specialties as a psychiatrist. I was part of a September 11th task force starting in 2001, and that sort of set the trajectory of my career. So I was really familiar with post-traumatic stress. And when I was sort of on these chat forums with my other colleagues, you know, they were all talking about like what to do, what to do, what to do. And they were being really, um, you know, sort of like aggressive in terms of intervention. And of course, well-meaning thinking about what can we do to help people? And I really was just like, you know, first of all, I had not been affected in a way like I was affected during this time, but I also thought about this idea of back to basics sort of this idea of psychological first aid. And this is what I came up with in terms of my art practice. So I, again, I call this back to basics, which basically was the idea that like, at that time we were questioning, do we need this? Do we need that? Do we need this? We were sort of functioning on minimal. Do I need to do this? Do I need to do that? We're, so I sort of reduced everything to colors, lines and shapes. And I thought to myself, well, what is it that actually draws me to art, you know, what is it that really draw? And I believe that at its very, very core, it was colors, lines, and shapes, no matter what kind of art I had done, whether it was portraiture, or illustration, or collage, or painting, or whatever, it was always about colors, lines, and shapes. And I really felt a lot of comfort from these pieces. And the other thing about these pieces is that they're made from the parts that I normally don't use. And so I thought about the idea of essentially like looking for beauty in unexpected places. The normal places that I looked for inspiration and beauty just were not giving that anymore. And of course I needed to look and I needed to look really, really take a good hard look at what society was looking at and for necessary reasons. But I also thought about this idea of balancing it out that I needed to maintain this sort of light inside of me so that I could be part of the solution when the time came and I could lend my wisdom or I don't know, maybe that's a grandiose word, but I could lend some sort of a hand. So I needed to keep this flicker on inside of me. And sort of the idea was that I created this work and it sort of kept me going. And I created more than 80 pieces of these. And these were shown in a gallery in camp and they actually made a lot of people happy. And when people feel happy for my work, that makes me happy. And then people would write to me and say, they were making collage. And I thought to myself, that's exactly what I wanna do. Art has been such a good friend to me over the course of my life. I wanted to share art with the rest of the world. And I purposely make art that I think is accessible, that people look at it and they say, oh, I can make that too. Because if I can convert somebody who just doesn't see themselves as a creative person to make art, I feel like I've just, you know, basically, I just, I, I just feel like that that's something that makes me really happy. This led to this uh, series, which I call Accidentalism. So I once upon a time, I heard the story of Matisse and Matisse basically, you know, at the end of his life, you know, he had overcome this very significant illness and he was so overjoyed for the fact that he had lived, but he was obviously very limited and he couldn't engage in the practice that he had normally engaged in. And that's where the Matisse cutouts came from. And what he did was I read about it, he painted paper with gouache. So for the past like nine months, I had been painting papers, you know, 
all just painting papers and changing all the, but I've been covering the table with the newspapers and the newspapers have all the COVID headlines on them. So basically it was sort of a way of immersing myself in the sort of what was going on in the day, but also protecting the papers. And this sort of this idea about accidentalism, which came up with, you know, Karen and Tina, I embrace that idea of accidentalism too, that we are so afraid of making accidents, but this idea of happy accidents is such an important idea. It should be part of like every educational program, I think. The idea that like sometimes unplanned things are the best things. And so basically, so I sort of wanted to, so what I did was I was painting all these papers and then I noticed that the newspapers that I was using to protect the floor and that I was using to wipe up the paint were like turning out to be beautiful. So I made about, I would say 25 of them and I'll show you what they look like. So these are just uh, 15 of them, but I made about 25 of them. And what they are, they are also collage. So I like this idea that you can always go back to something. One of the things that people struggle with in life is the idea that that's it, it's over, that was my chance, you know, I can't go back to it. But for me, especially with collage, it's like you can always cut it up and put it back together again in a new way. I feel like that's a lesson that maybe should also be like in high school and junior high and stuff like that. It's like, it's not over till it's over. You can always go back. You can always refine it. It may not be for 20 years, you know? So that's why some of my pieces, they take two years, three years to finish, you know? But the idea here is this, is that you can always go back and you can always rework it in some way. I, for me, that's a very comforting idea. And then sort of, this is the, uh, this is sort of a combination of the two of the sort of the accidental style plus the abstract cutout style. And these are the printed papers. These are printed papers like with a, with a block print and also painted papers and a variety of other methods that come together. And this is sort of a new series. So this series sort of was born, you know, like they say, you know, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. This new series was born sort of as my, you know, out of, uh, out of, this, out of this, you know, very challenging time. And then the last thing I want to talk about is this workshop that I created, which I also see as a collaborative work of art. In other words, that I sort of set, I, I believe in Carl Rogers, sort of like the idea, well, he's a psychologist and he sort of talked about the idea of the create a space where creativity can thrive, you know, and a lot of magical things happen. So I created this space online where basically it was a five week course. I have a specific method that I use for my collages, which is called Observation, Deconstruction, Rehearsal, Assembly. It's four modules. All the, all the students come together. We came together in an online forum once a week for five weeks, and it was a phenomenal experience. It was really surprising how it worked so well as an online experience. It was a real surprise. I'm going to continue it online even afterwards because the people were connected in a new way and people basically, you know, it was just a very, it was just like this, um, this open studios program. It brought us together in ways in which we didn't imagine and that we probably will continue some of these things that we're doing now, because in some ways, you know, we're more distant from each other, but we're closer together at the same time. So I'm going to continue to offer this collage, but the students, they made phenomenal, phenomenal work. I learned a tremendous amount and it was sort of like a collaborative experience. In other words, we sort of all came together to create this experience, which I sort of almost feel like it was like performance art, that everybody played their part and that we all left all with a concrete representation of what we made and also of the memory of the experience. Now I have gone back to the figurative collage and I'm working on that again too, but in a different way, And but that's for another talk. So that is my experience. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen. It was just fantastic dive into your Spaces of wonder. I love that. Uh, so Thanks. it's open up for questions. Uh, everybody wants to unmute yourself, jump in. Okay, I have a question. Sure. Well, it's almost a question. Um, it's an observation, and I guess I'm looking for a comment. Um, the uh, figurative work is absolutely pristine and it, it looks like such a different approach from the abstract work, um, both the ones on the on the papers uh, and the ones that are more hard edge. Uh, and those are so intuitive um, and what you call happy accidents or whatever. I, you know, I, I, I like to think of them as kind of selected accidents. You decide what to use and whatnot. But um, there's such a such a big vast difference from the approach. And I'm just looking for a comment about it. I, I can't really even formulate a specific question. So I'm curious to hear what you have to say. Thank you. And it was a wonderful presentation. 
Thank you, thank you. So, you know, we talked about, I, I focused the, 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 the uh, collage talk about memory too, but I also think about this idea of identity and that basically that we have different parts of our personality that are often in tension with each other and that often go along. In other words, and that's some of the things that we don't, uh, you know, we don't sort of tolerate in other people too. In other words, that we can both be whimsical and unrestrained and meticulous. And so I have sort of both of these sides of myself that I'm constantly balancing. So I think that in some ways that basically that the COVID experience allowed me to sort of, you know, express that. I also felt that to express that side of me, I also felt that, you know, during a time of trauma, you know, things were up in pieces. In other words, if one of the ways in which we describe trauma, you know, as trauma therapists is the idea that it's like shrapnel. In other words, that are all these pieces floating in the air and then we try to consolidate them. But one of the things that I think about uh, the difference between post-trauma and trauma is that during a post-traumatic period, yeah, we put everything together, right? But during the trauma itself, we just sort of do what we can to get through it. And that's sort of what that accidental work was about. In other words, certain therapists, I noticed they were trying to pull everything together. And I was thinking, no, we need to just basically, we need to figure out a way of just suspending ourselves. And that's what that work was about in a lot of ways. Thank you. There was a question by Anita Rabinov, I think, on the chat. You can unmute yourself. I was just curious about where you source your imagery, um, especially like the um, the vintage images. And since I used to do a lot of collage from magazine images, but there aren't a lot of magazines around anymore. So uh, we, um, I, I was just wondering how you source them. I think that's a, I love that idea. That the idea that I, I'm I'm reluctant to say that magazines are disappearing because it's hard for me to even allow that grief to happen. Although for years though, I've been aware of the fact that magazines are disappearing, and that's sort of also been like this idea of like that I'm not going to get stuck in this magazine sort of realm that I have to figure out a way of branching out, which is sort of a terrifying idea because I've obviously spent so much time do you know developing that technique. But I get the magazines from the recycling bin. And people who are uh, people who know that I make collage will often get involved and then send me or drop it off. But it's it's always from uh, a secondhand source. Serena, go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I I noticed as did the first Audrey that your your collages are are very restrained, but the the COVID pieces are very very joyful. They're very buoyant. They have a lot of color and they have a lot of, interestingly, you have scenes in your collages that are in your other collages, your previous work that are um, joyful. I mean, they're weddings and all kinds of things, but they don't exude any of the joy. I'm wondering if your post COVID things that you're working or not post, but this time now, whatever this is, this transition, whether they combine some of the color and buoyancy um, that you achieved in these accidentalist kinds of pieces with the previous stuff, or whether you're really going back to that restrained, holding that buoyancy inside somewhere instead of letting it out the way you've done during COVID, which was, I think, phenomenal. I, you know, I don't know exactly yet. I'm sort of, I'm, I'm holding back in terms of making any sort of like, again, I still feel like we're sort of floating. So I haven't even, you know, I haven't, I haven't done it, but I like that. I, but I, I do think that I think of art also, like now that I've been making art full time, I think of it as also a dialogue. And mm -hmm. that, that, the, that when I was putting out these pieces and then sort of the response that I was getting that people were, I, I thought in the beginning, I wasn't, I was sort of reluctant to show that work because, you know, I was thinking, you know, I have to be really serious, but I was getting all of this feedback, like, thank you. You know, this is, so that dialogue is sort of built in some ways such that the, the work has become happier because I think it's because it makes people happy. And of course, I was in the business before of alleviating, you know, and, and helping people to feel well-being. So it was working, but I'm not sure where it's going to go. The, it's funny, though, that you ask about where the figurative collage is going. They are still sort of restrained. So it's going to be interesting to figure out how to put those two tensions together. It, you know, that's a lifelong process. Good thing is that I have, you know, I will probably not stop making art anytime soon. So I'll be able to explore that. Well, you may not want to think about it so much. That's what you're talking about, right? The accidentalist piece, maybe that's where you need to let it go. Because I think that 
there's a beauty and a grace in those pieces that you did during COVID that is, it's not that the, the collages aren't amazing, they are, but the beauty and the grace and the joy and the dance, the, the real dancing that you see in those pieces is something I, I wouldn't want to lose if I were you. Thank not you. because they give other joy, others joy, but because they seem to be coming from some kind of wellspring in you. It's, and that's worth cultivating. It's yeah. true. Judith said, you know, physician, heal thyself. So. Yeah. So thank you very much. Um, I'm Sandra Ende, the most of the artist and psychoanalyst. Um, I learned a lot from your presentation, but the I can't remember the author of this. Who said the, it was an analyst? Um, going to pieces without falling apart. Oh, that is um, Mark. Um, he's a Buddhist too. Uh, Epstein. Yeah. Epstein, right? I think so, but that's what came to mind throughout your presentation, that there are all these pieces that could just fly away, but somehow they moved together. I, it, it just represented to me it was a, a statement emblematic of your work, which thank I you. enjoy very much. Wonderful. Um, Stephen, I want to thank you for the generosity of your presentation. I feel like I gained so much inspiration artistically, therapeutically, and also as a teacher. Um, you have a wonderful way of sharing everything about your work in order to bring other people up. And I think that's an incredible approach. And I'm sure that everybody here has felt the benefit of that in just this brief time. So thank you for that. I also want to thank Karen and Tina for your outstanding presentations. You each were unique and stimulating and informative in your own way. And it was a fantastic program. Thank you for participating uh, and everyone for attending. Our next programs are March 9th at noon Eastern time fe featuring artist Una Verver and Cynthia Beth Rubin. Also Sunday, March 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern time, we are having a program featuring the Authenticity Identity exhibit at Addis Israel Congregation in Washington, DC. It was a juried exhibit, um, which includes many Jewish Art Salon members. And a uh, few of them will be speaking along with the curator or Ori Saltz and the director, Robert Bettman. So I hope to see you next March 9th. And thank you so much, everyone, for coming. <laughs>